If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis 33, we'll get ready to begin this morning. Let's first of all look to God. Lord, thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, your word, it's a light to us. It guides us. It, it's, our, our, it's the very words from your mouth. We live by them. And so, Lord, we pray, help us to feast this morning on your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 33. Now, <clears throat> it's, a, it's not a long chapter. It's a great chapter. It says here, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah, unto Rachel, and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given, thy, graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. Leah also with her children came near, bowed themselves. After came Joseph near, Rachel, and bow, they bowed themselves. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep it thou hast unto thyself. Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou was pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. And he said, Let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, the flocks and the herds will with young are with me, and if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure, until I come unto my Lord unto Seir. And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkot, and built him a house, and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place is called Sukkot. And Jacob came to Shalom, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And he came from Padanaram, and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field which he had spread, where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of man money. And he erected an alt there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Now, what we find here in chapter 33, which is so interesting, is that this is the reconciliation between Jacob and Esau. And we know that, that, that in, in, the pic in the big picture, this is one little part of the big picture. It's not the whole big picture and the reconciliation. There's a bigger picture for Jacob just like there's a bigger picture for our lives. I mean, Esau is not the picture as the troubles we have in our lives. That's not really part of the big picture. But what's happened to Jacob here is a typical pattern for what happens in the life of a believer. Jacob, just like you, just like me, we, just like every person, what happens? We sin, we become a friend of the world, and we become blind to the fact that we have no idea that because of the sin, because of the friendship with God, we've become a friendship with the world, we've become an enemy of God. As it says in James 4 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's a frightful words, enemy of God. Every person is just like Jacob as we see him, just oblivious to the fact that the real problem in life is that he was an enemy of God. So as Jacob here comes with some immediate problem in his life, and like, like us, we have an immediate problem in our life. Maybe it's a health issue, or in this case, it was a person who was against him. He thinks that immediate problem is 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 is. is is, is the problem in my life, and if I get this solved, then everything will be fine. So he focused on the immediate problem, and, and, and it didn't get resolved, and in this case, he, 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 he wasn't able, in his first try, to make peace with his enemy Esau, 
And the problem becomes the driver to God. So if there was, if there was no e- enemy, Esau, then he wouldn't, we wouldn't see Jacob wrestling with God. But thank God for, for the Esau enemies of life because they, that's what drives the soul to God. And so all the while, a person never realizes his real problem is not what he thinks his real problem is. His real problem is not his immediate problem. His real problem is that he's an enemy of God, and God doesn't want him to be his enemy, so he allows his problems come to drive him to God. So Jacob turns his focus on God, and then he makes peace with God, and, and, and oh, by the way, the problem with Esau, it's just mysteriously solved. Have you ever read, when you read this chapter 33, did you ever ask yourself the question, what happened with Esau? What, 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 what occurred with Esau that he goes through this tremendous change uh, of, of, on one, uh, of, of wanting to, vowing to kill Jacob to running and embracing, crying and kissing? What happened? We don't know. We don't know. It's kind of like the love of God. What caused God to love us? We don't know. Something mysterious happened. Something mysterious happened. Yeah, that's the way it is. Jacob makes peace with Esau. And that's where we find him now, a different man. He's made peace with God because of chapter 32. Makes peace with Esau because of chapter 32. So we, we, just, we, we can just see how d- different Jacob is when we look at how he responds to Esau's first question. Verse 5 here are the first words that these two brothers have exchanged in 21 years. And Esau, it says there, he lifted up his eyes. He saw the women and children and said, who are those with thee? And he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servants. See, Esau sees the family. He sees the 11 or 12 little ones. The eldest one's about 14 years old. And they're following, you know, Jacob. And so Esau asks the question, you know, who are these? Who are these? Now, what would have been the normal answer to a question like this. I mean, if you, were, if, if you were there and someone asked you who those kids were, what would you say? Kids. Those are my kids. <laughs> it's real simple. Those are my kids. I mean, you know, if, 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 if you, if, let's say something, if you went to Denny sometimes, you're little kids, and, and the waitress asked you, you know, who are these, you know, would you say, well, these are the children that God hath graciously given to me. <laughs> would you say that? <laughs> if you did, see the waitress kind of look at you funny. <laughs> Go over to the supervisor, you know, table three. <laughs> Watch out. It's a real nutcase, you know. <laughs> but this is astounding, the, the, way, the way Jacob, you know, he responds here. He just doesn't give that standard answer like that. And it gives, it's very revealing to him. To, to us, you know, we, we, we can learn about Jacob when he said, these are the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. What does it show us about Jacob? It shows us that God was in, in Jacob's thoughts. You, you could tell that God was in Jacob's thoughts by the way he talked. Jacob didn't just see his children know, as a biological event or just as normal to have, you know, children of a man and woman get married. Jacob saw his children as a gift from God that, 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 that he had for no other reason but the grace of God. And, and so he said, that, he said that, Jacob said that because this shows a difference in Jacob. Now his eyes are constantly on God. And it's making a difference in Jacob's talk. It's making a difference in Jacob's trust. And it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind. It's a state of heart that uh, David describes in, in Psalm 25, 15. Psalm 25, 15, when David says, Mine eyes are ever constantly toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. See, that's the state of mind. That's a state of heart. It's described as mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. That's the state. See, Psalm 25, 15, it describes a focus and an expectation. The focus, mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. This means his, that is, in his normal life, his eyes are on God. And he's constantly looking to God. He's praying to God. He's looking to God for direction. He's looking to God for guidance. He's looking to God for instruction. What do I do now? And this state of mind and heart is, is described as God is in all his thoughts. And David drew the contrast between, uh, uh, between that person and, and that God is in all his thoughts and a person who does not have God in all his p- thoughts in, in Psalm 10.4. Psalm 10 verse 4, he says, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. He won't go to God. 
because of pride. God is not in all his thoughts. See, isn't it interesting how in Psalm 10:4, that verse, it doesn't say God was not in any of his thoughts, but Psalm 10:4 says God was not in all his thoughts. All his thoughts. That state of mind and heart is a matter of God either being in all the thoughts or God not being in all the thoughts. It will either be God in all the thoughts or God and not in all the thoughts. It's just that simple. Now, why do we need God in all our thoughts? Because without God in all our thoughts, we are a generator of evil thoughts. That's, that's our problem. Without God in all our thoughts, we're a generator of evil thoughts, and that's, that's, that's what God calls wicked. And God describes this wickedness of man without God in all his thoughts and generating these evil thoughts when he told Noah in Genesis 6-5, Genesis 6-5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Hmm? So there, there's God. He's talking about the frequency of the evil thoughts of man without God. And he said only evil continually. Another place he describes that frequency in Psalm 56.5, Psalm 56.5, every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. That's what God's speaking. He says every day they're changing my words and all their thoughts are against me for evil. And so God talks about the direction of these evil thoughts in man without God. And he talks about that in Isaiah 9, 59, verse 7, Isaiah 59, verse 7, where he says, their feet run to evil, they make haste to shed innocent blood, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. See, those evil thoughts, that's a generator of evil thoughts. Man is a generator of evil thoughts if God is not in all his thoughts. And those evil thoughts in man without God in his thoughts, are known to the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows them. And when it says, and he speaks about that in Matthew 9, 4, Matthew 9, 4, where it says, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts. We need, we need God in all our thoughts because if we don't, our hearts sink back into becoming this generator of evil thoughts. And the Lord Jesus Christ described that dilemma or disease in Matthew 15, 19. Matthew 15, 19, when he said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, fault witness, false witness of blasphemies. See, David understood that his heart would become a, a, a heart of a, 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 of, of a generator of evil thoughts unless God was in all his thoughts. So he was sensitive to, to what takes his eyes off of God. And so, so second to this, David has an expectation from God where he says, he shall pluck my feet out of the net. So he's expressing his hope that God is going to take his feet out of the net. He's not saying, he's not saying God's going to prevent my feet from going into the net. But when my feet do go into the net, his expectation is for God to, 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 to pluck or take his feet out of the net. So, he's a, so his eyes are ever toward the Lord to deliver him. See, that's a religion of dependence on God. And why did David, why did he say this? You know, what did he mean when he said pluck? What did David mean when he said he'll pluck my feet out of the net? It's interesting it's interesting, because it, the, 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 it's interesting because where that Hebrew word is used, yatsa, where it's used first is in creation, in Genesis chapter 1, where, where God said in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself after his kind. God saw it was good. See, God said, let the earth yatsa, let the earth bring forth and, 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 and these wonderful vegetation, wonderful vegetation, food. So 
How did the earth yatza? How did the earth bring forth vegetation? Miraculously and by God's command. How did David expect his feet to be yatza, plucked from the net? Miraculously and by God's command. The having his feet plucked out of the net is the opposite of what he spoke about in Psalm 915, Psalm 915. The heathen are sunk down, sunk down. They're drowned, tabas, they're drowned, in the pit that they made, in the net which they, which they hid, is their own foot taken. So when God said that, that, that I mean really, when, when God said that he was gonna bring this out of the earth, and David uses the same word, shows an expectation back to God of the kind of way in which he was expecting to be delivered. And Jacob said that God had graciously given him these children. I mean, Jacob's, are, Jacob's eyes are ever toward the Lord. God was in all his thoughts. So when he uses the word graciously, he says, they're a gift. They're a gift to him. I mean, he, said, he didn't deserve them. They were just given to him by the grace of God. Now, after Jacob has finally prevailed on Esau, you remember it was a tense situation uh, about this gift in verses 8 through 12, because Esau it was no, no, yes, no, so oh boy. But the, Esau says something amazing. He says something amazing to, to Jacob in verse 12, and he said, let us, let us take our journey and let us go. Wow, what's that? Esau wants to be with Jacob? You know, God has made Esau to not only not be Jacob's enemy, but to be Jacob's friend. Now he's his friend, and, he, and, he, and, and he, he wants to be with him, and he starts off, he's got all these questions in verse 5. You know, who are those with thee? And verse 8, what meanest thee by all this drove which I met? He has so many questions, and Esau feels that, that, that there's so much that you and I need to catch up on, Jacob, that's happened over the last 21 years, so let's start right here in the middle of the desert, you know, and, and then Esau says, no, no, wait, this isn't such a good idea. Uh, let, let, let's not do this here in the middle of the desert. Uh, let, let's take our journey. Let's go, and, and I'll go before you. Jacob, is, 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 Esau is really saying at this point, I know you come over to my house, and, and, and we're going to catch up on everything. Come on over. Stay a while. We'll talk. We got 21 years to catch up on. I want to know everything. That's really nice. And, and so, okay. Now, East, th think about if you're Jacob, that sounds really nice. Oh, it's great. You know, I'm sure there's going to be food. and you know, It's a wonderful time of talking and of catching up and telling the stories. And oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just going to be a great time. That's what fellowship is. It's wonderful. Now, Esau has just made a proposal to Jacob. Let us take our journey and let us go. And it's very interesting for Jacob, really exciting, you know. It's my area. And now Esau's proposal, it leaves Jacob with four options. And it's interesting to see these four options and to see the option that Jacob chose. Because Esau's proposal in verse 12 and, and the four options that Jacob had really give us an illustration of what it means to be inconsiderate of others and what it means to be considerate of others. All right, option, uh, well, option one. I get the ball rolling. Option one. Jacob could have turned to his family and said, Esau is my only sibling. He's my twin brother. We fought for 70 years at home. <laughs> and that's funny. I mean, like, reminds me of a time when we were telling David, you know, Joseph might join the company of brothers, my sons. And so my son David, Joseph might join the company, and David kind of pauses and he thinks to himself, while we were growing up, we fought with each other. I guess we'll continue the fight now. <laughs> anyway, all right, sorry for that side note. All right, he, he could have said, Esau is my only sibling. He's my twin brother. We fought for 70 years at home. I haven't seen him for 21 years. We've just been reconciled. I'm so excited. I have so much I want to talk over with him. Hey, you know what? Says his family. The men servants will bring you along safely while I'll catch up on old times with Esau. Now, if he had done that, 
that scenario, which he didn't do, that scenario would have been inconsiderate of his family. And if Jacob had, if Jacob had chosen that option, Jacob would have only been thinking of himself. Jacob would have been selfish. Jacob would have forsaken his family. I know Christians that forsake their family for church. Uh, every time the church doors open, sometimes every night, they're, they're, they leave their family and they go to church. In essence, they're taking option one and saying to their family, church means a lot to me. I've got a lot of friends there. I've got to put God first, so you all stay here at home while I go off to church. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong for a man to, to, uh, of the house to go off to prayer meeting. It's not at all wrong, is it, Irene? <laughs> yeah, uh, on, on Wednesday night. As long as they're not forsaking their family. A person has to be very sensitive to not forsake his family for church. And one reason that Jacob did not do option one is because uh, of how he saw his children. See? How did he, how, he, 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 call, he calls his children what he calls children. He says the uh, children... In, in verse 6, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. So he sees his children as a gift from God. That gift came with responsibilities. And Jacob understood that he had responsibilities of husbandship and he had responsibilities of fatherhood. And Jacob uh, uh, was not just the brother to Esau. Jacob was the husband to Rachel and Leah and, ja and, and, and the father of, of uh, 11 boys and at least one daughter. And, and in verses 13 and 14, he is thinking of them. And, the, and the, you know, the word is interesting, consider. The, 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 the Hebrew word that's used here has a meaning of separate. Separate, it means to separate. A, you know, a, 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 a picture, in, in other words, you separate, uh, cons uh, you, you separate. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to say that. You know, I, I love that 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 very very famous, um, very moving scene in in Fiddler on the Roof, uh, uh, which I call uh, is on the other hand scene. You know, where 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 Chava the the daughter wants to marry the Gentile Fiedka, the the Russian, and and Chava's father, you know, Tevya, he considers whether or not to reject his daughter Chava. <laughs> something a little close to home for me. And every time I look at that, it, it brings tears to my eyes because I experienced that when I married a Gentile. Anyway, in this, in, 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 so th th this is this on the other hand scene. And, and Chava comes to Tevya and begs her father to accept them. And, and, and Tevya goes through this, this, this thing. He says, accept them? How can I accept them? He says, can I deny everything I believe in? Uh, and then he goes, on the other hand, can I deny my own daughter? And, he, and then he goes back, he goes, on the other hand, <laughs> how can I turn my back on my faith, my people? And, and then he sits there and he says, if I try and bend that far, I'll break. On the other hand, no, he says, you know, there is no other hand. And then Tevya screams at Chava, no, no, no. It's a terrible scene. Anyway, that's what it means to consider this, this uh, the, to look at on the other hand. But, but when prejudice takes over, as it did in his case, Tevya stops considering. He says there is no other hand. Other hand. The Hebrew word here, bean, means to, it means to separate. Separate your interests from the interests of others. Jacob wanted to go with Esau, but, uh, but, but Jacob considered with his, on the other hand, his children and his young animals. And God calls on man to consider two great issues in life. The first issue is, is in Deuteronomy 32, 29. Where, where God says, oh, that they were wise and they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. See, the first issue that God wants man to consider is, what's going to happen to me when I die? What's going to happen to me after I die? There's a Holocaust survivor right now in his 80s. He's calling for the rabbi because he wants, as he says, assurance. He's thinking about what's going to happen to me when I die. The second great issue that God calls man to consider is given to us in, in Isaiah 1, Isaiah 1, 3, where it says, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his mother's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. God is saying his people do not consider how he has taken care of them. 
And then later on in that chapter, in verse 18, Isaiah 118, Isaiah 118, he says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So God is saying that his people are not considering that their sins can be forgiven. God is saying his people are not considering his invitation to come and reason so their sins can be forgiven. And then when he steps out from, from behind the, the, the drape of the skies in Matthew 23, 37, he says directly in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 23, 37, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And ye would not. God's very sad about that. Very sad that men do not consider his kind offer to, 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 that he made when he came here in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to save him from their sin, save man from their sin. In consideration is prejudice. See, that, that, it's to say with Tevya, there is no other hand. See, that's what I face all the time in my work with the Jewish people. Interest in, interest in, in what I'm saying until I say one name, Jesus. Then I'm in Selma, Alabama in the 1950s, and I just talked about a good black person. <laughs> That's the way it is. Oh, he's black? Oh, sorry, we won't consider, you know. Oh, you're talking about Jesus? No. We're, it's over. Like the rabbi who said to me as I was talking to him, he says, you see these long curls? It's a Hasidic rabbi from Jerusalem. See these long curls? And I said, I said yes, rabbi. He says, Watch this. And he took his curl and he put it in front of his ear. And he said, this curl is now a block wall. <laughs> I can't hear anything you're saying. If Jacob had taken option one of going with Esau, Jacob would have been inconsiderate of his family. All right, option two. Let me ask you, what would have been another option for Jacob to have proposed uh, to, to, to Esau? I called Joe the one he could have proposed to his family. Now, what could he have proposed to Esau? Yeah. Forget you. Say it again. Forget you, Esau. Forget you? <laughs> okay, well, I wasn't thinking of that one. <laughs> How about another one? T take another card, Clinton. <laughs> okay. All right. He could have turned to Esau and said, Esau, my family and animals can't go that fast, so why don't you what? No, that's what he did do. <laughs> why don't you slow down? Why don't you slow down and take the pace of my family? Why don't, why, why, you know, it, it, it just change your pace. Just change your pace for us. You know? Now, now <laughs> if he had said that, that would not have been considered a, a 400 men that Esau had, you know, and of course, you know, they got to burn off that big breakfast they eat every morning, so, you know, they, 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 that, that would have been inconsiderate to them. Okay, option three, option three would have been to, to, to turn to his family and say what? Pick up the pace. <laughs> right? Let's pick up the pace, right? Everyone pick up the pace so I can spend more time with Esau. In other words, this would have been Jacob dragging his family to keep up with, with Esau's pace. I know Christians who don't want to miss out on church functions, so they drag their families to church, you know? Consideration must be the rule. Now, Jacob, he takes option four, which was the choice of consideration. He considers Esau as 400 men, doesn't want to slow him down considers his children and his family, and, and in the next two verses then, he tells us that he, that, that he had separated his interests, being this uh, consideration, separated his interests from the interest of, of Esau and family and looked at him the, and the animals. And, and so this, this, this uh, idea of consideration is to separate our interests from the interest uh, of others, just as Jacob did. When, when we do that, when Jacob did that, when we do that, then, then there is a fulfillment of Philippians 2.4. Philippians 2.4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I mean, Jacob was excited naturally. He felt excitement. And, 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 but when he looked at his children and his animals, and he felt their weakness, we, then he fulfills 
Romans 15.1, he fulfills Romans 15.1, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. See? When Jacob made that decision, Jacob decided not to seek his own, and Jacob fulfilled that part in the great love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, charity love seeks not her own. Now, now we see the reason why Jacob took this option four, which was really the choice of consideration, and he made this choice for option four because he's being considerate, not just of people, his, his family, but also of animals. And, 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 and that's described as a righteous person in, in Proverbs 12.10. Proverbs 12.10. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Now, Jacob describes the children, his children to Esau, when he says in verse 13, the children are tender. The children are tender. With that statement, Jacob looks at the condition, he says, they're tender. The word tender is used to describe the, the, the special mercies of the Lord. They're called tender mercies. Not just mercies, but tender mercies. And David was the greatest, in the Psalms we find this term most used there, tender mercies of the Lord, Racham. And so it's referring to, David's almost always referring to the tender mercies of the Lord in relation to forgiving our sins. See, we get a picture from Jacob here of, what this, uh, of, of when God forgives our sins because, uh, because of his tender mercies, just as Jacob, he turns and he looks, he considers how weak the children were. He calls them tender. And, 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 and then, he, he, in other words, he means they're weak, they're vulnerable, and he makes compensation for the children. So God considers our weak state, and therefore, because of his tender mercies, he forgives us. As it says in Psalm 103, 11, Psalm 103, 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, that's a scene for Jacob and his children, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. And then it says, and it speaks about the history of Israel when, you know, in Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is, you can't read Psalm 78 with going, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. They did that. They did that. They did that. It's kind of a recap of, uh, of, uh, of what you find in, in the first five books, Moses. But anyways, in Psalm 78, it's, it gives kind of a summary of what happened in verse 37, Psalm 78, verse 37, where it says, their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. See, that's what the tender mercies of God are, are all about. It's considering our weaknesses to sin and forgiving us because of his tender mercies. In Psalm 25, 6, Psalm 25, verse 6, Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have ever been of old. When David called on God, how do you, how do, you do the horrible sins that David does, and then you call on God to forgive you? How do you do that? How do you, how, how do you rape a wife and murder her, her husband, and then call on God to forgive you? How did he do it? In Psalm 51, 1, he starts off and he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Psalm 103, verse 4. Psalm 103, verse 5, 4. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. But no one should be deceived or presume that God's just going to carte blanche, forgive any person unless that person fears God, repents of their sin, and calls on the name of the Lord Jesus to save them. Because God makes that very clear in Numbers 14, 18. Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. 
See, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's, for, it, it's forgiving iniquity and transgression when he's called upon. Hmm? And, and in John 3, 16, that's the whole idea with that, that little, that, that provision there. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And here's the provision that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not everyone, but just whosoever believes into him. So it's significant in verse 13 that Jacob describes the flocks as with me. The flocks are with me. You know, it's a, it's, it's a good thing to, to, to look at a family. A husband should look at a family and says, you know, my wife is with me. My children are with me. And when he's, because when he says that, he's owning responsibility to take care of them. And then he says he feared for their death from just one day of being overdriven. He's just told Esau. Esau's pace was not acceptable because the children are tender and the animals will die from being overdriven. Now, it, oh, is there some other reason that you can think of? Is there some other reason that Jacob maybe didn't tell Esau for why his pace was not acceptable? Any other reason? Yeah, he couldn't walk. He was Chester. <laughs> he couldn't walk. He's got a limp. He can't, he can't keep up with Esau's pace. He's got just had his hip out of joint. He, you know, he didn't mention that to Esau, you know. Okay, never mind. All right, so now <laughs> Jacob has given the reasons to Esau. Why, why we see, and, and we see that in verse 30, 14, verse 13. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant. I'll lead on softly according to the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure till I come unto my Lord and see her. See, Jacob says to Esau, he should go before Jacob. That's self-sacrificing on his part. He let, he's letting the opportunity pass. And Jacob heard, and, 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 and when Jacob heard that, he wondered himself, boy, that doesn't sound like the same brother I knew when I was growing up. You go before me? <laughs> it was always the opposite. He's, he's a changed person here. He says, the, Jacob was never willing to let Esau go before him. Jacob's mission in life <laughs> was to push Esau out of the way. But now he's saying, you go first. He's a changed person. And Jacob says something that we, that, that, that we have not seen in him before in verse 13. I will lead on softly. He says, it's not the words that we know about Jacob the driver. These are the words of Jacob who's changed. He's gentle. He's tender. He's got a caring heart, uh, like, like, like of a mother nursing a child, nursing her baby. You know, a mother nursing her baby, it's the ultimate picture of tenderness and gentle, loving care. And, 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 and we know that only mothers nurse their children. But God calls that picture out and told kings to lovingly, tenderly care for his people in the same way as a nursing mother. And he calls the kings... In Isaiah 49, 23, nursing fathers, and the king shall be thy nursing fathers, he says. Moses understood, he understood this, that he was called by God to, to lovingly, tenderly care for God's people as if he was a, uh, uh, if he's a uh, and he calls himself nursing father in Numbers eleven twelve. that thou should say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, beareth the sucking child, this caring, this lovingness, this tenderness of a nursing mother is how Paul described, as we heard before, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth, cherisheth her children. So, in, in, in verse 14, J Jacob described what would determine his pace. Jacob, he, he, he told Esau, your pace, uh, he, he says, my pace is going to be determined by what the cattle and what the children are able to endure. See, and what we see Jacob doing here is important for us because it's a spirit that we should imitate of the gentleness and the consideration. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 40, verse 11, Isaiah 40, 11, it says, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. So he says again, in John 10, verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So these words that Jacob used here, be able to endure, they're, they're, they show this tender shepherd idea. You know, and, and, 
And the picture of Jacob caring for the cattle and the children and setting the pace according to what they can endure, it's a, it's a picture for us of what God allows in our lives. You know, uh, I, I, I tell you, I, I have a bad habit, I'll c confess it to you, I have a bad habit, that whenever I do something that um, I, I shouldn't do, like, I, I, like I, I shouldn't have tried to chop the celery with the serrated knife and my, having my finger that looked like a piece of celery and almost chopped my finger off here, I have a big scar from there to there. Yeah, I did that. I, I shouldn't have dropped the pork chop uh, into the plate of 500 degree oil without gloves on. I have second degree burn from there. And I have others too. I, I, I can show you if you doubt me, but it doesn't matter. Um, every time I do that, something like that, my first response is I always say, oh no, that's what I do. <laughs> I don't know, it's really a cry for turn the clock back, please. <laughs> Redo this one. Can we rewrite this as if it didn't happen? Well, I, I don't like it when I do that, but I do that. Anyway, God monitors what happens to us, and he only allows what, what happens as, as we're able to endure it. He says that in, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, such as common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be contempted above that you are able. God controls the filters but will with the temptation also make a way up to escape that you may be able to bear it. So just as Jacob said that the pace would be determined by what the cattle and the children are able to endure, those are his words, able to endure, so the troubles in our lives are determined by God by what we are able to endure, able to endure. Now, uh, we come now to verse 17, and we see at last Jacob is on his way home. He's homeward bound. Anyways, that's what he is for Hebron. Uh, verse 17, Jacob journeyed to Sukkot, Sukkot, and um, uh, Sukkot's interesting, you know, Sukkot means booths, and it's named that because he built booths for his cattle. When we uh, lived in Lakeside, I used to build a lot of these 10 by 10 sheds for, for, in, for our animals, and my wife Cheryl said that she was calling the place Sukkot, because <laughs> that's all we had was booths around. Anyway, so, okay, as, as we look at Jacob now, moving on, we can see that Poor Jacob is just emotionally shattered. He's shattered emotionally. I mean, he's just gone through. He's gone through a near fatal encounter with Laban that ended with a truce treaty. <clears throat> he's gone through an all-night struggle with God that ended with Jacob being reconciled with God. He, he sees God face to face. He receives a new name. He gets a new limp. <laughs> Now, now there was all this crying, emotional outpour from the meeting of Esau with the complete reconciliation, but Jacob's still standing. This has been pretty rough emotionally on Jacob, and it's understandable that at this point in Jacob's life, he just needs a rest. So what we're seeing here when he reaches Sukkot in verse 17, he built him a house. So Jacob builds himself a house. As we look at Jacob, we sympathize with him as we see him build his, his first house, his first house of his own. We're happy for Jacob. He finally builds himself a first house, and we hope his house is spacious and it's got a nice location and good weather, nice garden. See, he's almost 100 years old, and, and these have been some pretty rough 100 years on this, on, on, of his life. And as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact about Jacob's life, toward the end of his life, Jacob is in this book going to stand before Pharaoh. And Jacob's rough life must have really shown on his face. Because when Pharaoh looks at him, Pharaoh's got only one question. It's, how old are you? <laughs> you know, he must have looked like he was a thousand years old. And, and when Jacob told, and Jacob told Pharaoh, you know, how old he was, it seems like Jacob w was saying, you know, to, to Pharaoh, look, you know, I know I'm a little shocking to look at. <laughs> so let me tell you why I look so old. Mm. And he commented on his life in Genesis 47, Genesis 47, 7, Genesis 47, 7. It says, Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the life, the days of the years of my life been, and not obtained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So this is how he explains to Pharaoh he, he, you know, why he looks so old. 
Yeah? It, it, because he says, Pharaoh, there's two words that I, I want to use to describe my life. Few and evil. <laughs> days of my life. Few and evil. In other words, Jacob told, told Pharaoh that his days were few because he, he, he was really not that old. And, and, it, but, and his few days have been evil. In other words, rough. And so when Jacob said to Pharaoh that his days had been few, he was saying to, to, to Pharaoh that life hasn't been easy and I'm ready for heaven. You know? And it's just like uh, Paul says in, in, in 2 Timothy 3.12, yea, 2 Timothy 3.12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So any believer who chooses to live a godly life will suffer persecution. Persecu persecution's not easy. Persecution, it, 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 it's... It makes a person long for heaven. And any person, now you say, okay, well, then I'm not going to choose godly. I mean, that's who wants that, right? But any believer who chooses to go the easy road and not live a life of holiness, he'll experience a certain love of God, talked about in Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. receiveth. So you can't win. <laughs> Either way, persecution or chastening, you make the person long for heaven, and you say with Jacob, few and evil have been the days of the years. It's interesting that when Jacob went back to focus on his life, he didn't say few and evil have been the weeks of the years of my life. He didn't say few and evil have been the months of the years of my life, but Jacob said few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. So Jacob thought about the days. He thought about the day he had to flee from home and the day that he woke up with, 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 with Leah when he thought, as his wife, when he thought it was going to be Rachel and the day that Laban caught up with him wanting to kill him and he says, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And, and by the way, what will you and I see when you and I do what Jacob did and look back over the days of the years of our lives? You know, I've been preparing for the message for Esther Montag's memorial service. And I was thinking about uh, what to ask her daughter to fill me in about that I didn't know about Esther. You know, as believers, we all have a life with God. And so I wanted to know about her life with God. And so I asked her daughter, tell me some of the instances in Esther's life where you could see that she was trusting the Lord. Because those are the times that God celebrates in the life of Esther. But Jacob doesn't, he does, Jacob, it's really charming here when we look at this about Jacob because he doesn't have any idea what's remaining at this point in Genesis 33. He doesn't have any idea what's remaining of those few and evil days that they're going to make up the rest of his life. And no one's telling him, well, we know because we have the chapters, but no one is telling, no one's telling us, about, we don't have any idea about the storms that you and I are going to have to face in life. Because, but, but both we and Jacob, we have the same shepherd God. But for the moment, we see Jacob, he's happily building his house. Such a happy time. Oh, build a house, move into a house, just like us. Happy time, rebuild the chapel, move back in the chapel. <laughs> and when we see Jacob here building a house, we realize at this point in his life, Jacob has fled home, lost his mother and father because of a brother who vowed to kill him, walked right into the spider web of a greedy Uncle Laban, ended up with four wives, he only wanted one, but he got four, a home that was more like a war zone, made a truce with Laban, wrestled with God, made peace with God, ended up with a new name, new limp for the rest of his life, made peace with Esau. Maybe Jacob is sort of thinking to himself, you know, he's building his house, oh boy, that's been, that's been, my life's been something. At long last, I can settle down and relax. You know, maybe he's thinking his troubles are over. And for the rest of his life, it's just going to be, that's 100 years old, smooth sailing. But we have what Jacob does not have, which is the rest of these chapters after 33. And we know what Jacob does not know. And we know what's coming up next for Jacob. And we see Jacob building a house, and we hope he gets a good rest because he's going to need it. <laughs> because what's next that he doesn't know about? The rape of his daughter, Dinah next chapter, who right now is around six years old. Shechem's offer to intermarry, uh, to be, that there should be an intermarriage. A fanatical revenge of Jacob's two sons, Levi and Simeon. The lying, treacherous plot of Levi and Simeon to murder a whole community of people. A bloody wedding 
of Dinah and Shechem that ends in this cruel massacre of the community with the sacking of the community. Jacob, having to pass the judgment of cruel murder on his two sons, Levi and Simeon, for their unjustified crime against this community. The lie that his favorite son, Joseph, was killed by wild beasts. While Jacob's sons really sold him into Egypt and a life-threatening famine. Apart from that, he said, I have a great life. <laughs> you know, you think about all that's awaiting him, it exhausts you. It's like, oh, man, it's amazing. You know, he doesn't have any idea what's coming around the corner. And all he knows is nice. In verse 17, Jacob journeys to Sukkot, built him a house. It's a good thing that he doesn't know about all the storms that he's going to face as he's building this house. We look at Jacob building his house in verse 17. He has no knowledge with the rest of the chapter. We don't have any we, we, we don't have any idea what the rest of the chapters in our life, what's the rest of the chapters in the book of our lives going to be. God knows. And God doesn't tell Jacob about all the trials he has to face in his life. God just provides Jacob this time now of a refreshing tranquility here for Jacob uh, to be strengthened, to be built up for what he's got to meet here. You know, at the end of this chapter, he builds himself an altar. It's great. He knows he needs repair. He knows he needs an altar. Time alone with God, he takes it. And God says in Deuteronomy 33, 25, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. There's going to be some really hard days ahead for Jacob, but God promises, you're going to have a faithful shepherd in me. And I'll give you the strength for each day. We'll get through this together. We don't know exactly what's going to be coming around the corner for us, but we know what this verse promises, that as our days, so shall our strength be. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being the God of Jacob, and thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to look into how you, Lord, were Jacob's God in the days of his life, and help us, Lord, to trust you also in Jesus' name. Amen.